they said that it's like 19,000. Which song goes first? Is Holy Spirit first? Okay. Good morning, Southeast. Great to see all of you here today. It is a joy to be in the house of the Lord together this morning. And welcome to all of you who are joining on Facebook Live and others who will be watching on YouTube eventually. And our opening scripture is found in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. This is the story of Zacchaeus. So Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Let us pray. Our gracious and holy Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your mercy upon us. And we thank you for bringing us together this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you would have your way in our midst, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, and that you would accomplish your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I invite you to stand and sing. Amen. Yes, dear Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, God, we just pray that the Holy Spirit fill this place right now and fill our presence and so we can feel his presence in Jesus' name. Amen. My 
shame is undone. Your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come, Lord, this place and fill the
it's running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life went down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. Our psalm today is Psalm number 90, and I invite you to turn there with me, Psalm number 90, and I want to take a moment and bring our praises and pains before the Lord, and so any special praises or pains that you would like to voice this morning? Praises or pains? Well, I'm having pains in my hips and my legs, so pray for that. All right. All right. Pray for you, Brother Mac. Anyone else? Bought it? Um, for my sister Dawn's health, and she's going for back surgery in another couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Prayers for that. But also, her um, grandbaby is about um, four months, uh, five months, and she's in, they've taken her back and forth to the emergency room, and she's back in this morning because of the virus that's going around that for babies, the difficulty breathing and respiratory. So, okay. We could just yeah, her name is Chevelle, and so if we could pray for baby Chevelle, that would be good. Also, I want to remember Brother Beto in prayer today, and uh, talked with him some yesterday, and his voice is sounding stronger, but he's still dealing with those migraines, and uh, his sight's coming back a little bit, but he hasn't had full recovery yet, so we want to continue to pray for Brother Beto, and uh, Brother Smith, remember your prayer request, we want to lift you in prayer this week. And then also our daughter, Rachel, um, pregnant with twins and has an appointment tomorrow. Uh, they have twin-to-twin -twin transfusion going on, which means one twin is giving and the other twin is taking, and there's kind of an imbalance going on. And so that's a pretty delicate situation. And so if we could just uh, pray for the twins, that things would even out a little bit. And uh, so I pray for Rachel and Chuck James as well. Uh, any other any other praises or pains request? Yeah, um, oh, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> oh, um, uh, my sister in Christ. She just gave birth four months ago. Her name's Elvina, uh -huh. and she's uh, still having to heal in certain really sensitive areas. Um, and so, if we could just lift her up and pray that okay. God uh, heals her uh, and all the infections and stuff. Okay. Okay. And Tom. Yeah. Um, or uh, my sister Rosalie. And remember the Fiendbrays family. I understand that they have a lot of cold or flu going around. 
Well, Psalm number 90, and I'll be reading from the NIV, and I invite you to pray this with me if you have an international version. If you have a different translation, just follow along. But after we pray Psalm 90, feel free to pray out, and then I'll pray, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. So Psalm number 90, and join with me. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass, and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Amen. Let us continue to pray. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, we just thank you so much for who you are. Yes, so you are uh, you are yes. the creator, the maker of the whole universe. Yes. You hold everything in your hand. Yes. You are the one that's in control of everything. Yes. You are. So we come to you wishing up to you today. We come up to you praising you. Mm-hmm. Yes, so we thank mm-hmm. you. And we just pray that God uh, has so many things that we go through, so many needs, so many requests. Mm-hmm. Just God, we bring them to you. Yes, you Lord. Know, there's no one else that we can go to. Yes, but Lord. you who can, do, who can do anything with our situation. Yes. And so we, we looked up that all this morning to you. Mm-hmm. We ask you to just go in and bring healing to us. Yes, Lord. Give him yes, strength. Lord. And, and let, you, let him know that your presence is there with him. Yes. And we just pray for Rachel and Chuck James. And yes, pray Lord. For twins. Mm-hmm. Pray to God that you handle the open twins. Yes, Lord. That you would work that out. That yes, you would Lord. Uh, evil things up. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Because we just uh, we, we looked up the, the the young lady that Christina said. Uh, yes, Lord. That, uh, that you know what's the need. Mm-hmm. But we looked mm-hmm. up to you and asked you to be with her to mm-hmm. help her in the situation mm-hmm. that she's going through. Yes. And probably the other requests is, uh, yes, Lord. Uh, that we're going through here, uh, God. Yes, Lord. That we, ask, we looked them up to you. Mm-hmm. Father, you know my need, you know mm-hmm. my need to pain. Mm-hmm. Father, just lift that up to you. And I yes, Lord. To, um, to bring healing to my body. Yes, Lord. To ease those pains. And, and uh, Father, we just don't know. Uh, but we listen to you. Mm-hmm. And we ask you to be with us the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. Help us uh, to hear your word, to receive your word today. Mm-hmm. To try your word in our life. Mm-hmm. And to trust you and to... Uh, be obedient. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be in your house this morning. There's no other place we'd rather be. And right. We thank you so much for your presence, Lord, mm -hmm. that is with us. And not only here, but Lord, all throughout the week. We thank yes. you that you watch over us, you care mm -hmm. for us, Lord. You know mm -hmm. all about us, and you meet our deepest needs. And Lord, yes. we're grateful for um, all the many good things that you have done this week. Lord, mm -hmm. we thank you for... Uh, sustaining us and strengthening us and giving us life and breath, Lord, to, to walk into your house this morning. Yes. And Father, we just um, thank you for uh, the many ways in which you continue to work, Lord, dry, uh, drawing people unto yourself. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that is at work and that is welcome here. Yes. Lord, we thank you that you work in each one of our hearts and our lives. Lord, we give you praise and glory for that today. Without you, Lord, we would just be lost. We would not be... Um, a child of God, Lord, and we know that you are working in our midst. We mm -hmm. thank you for that. Lord, we just ask that you would continue, Lord, as Brother Mac has already prayed, to touch those that need a special physical touch yeah. from you. Yes, pray Lord. for Brother Smith today, yeah. Lord. Yes, we know Lord. his needs. We ask, Lord, that you would just touch his body, Lord, mm -hmm. and bring healing uh, where is needed, Lord. We mm -hmm. pray that you would uh, just bless him as he sees doctors, Lord, that they would just have wisdom and guidance to know how best to help him. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray the same for Brother Beto today, Lord, that you just touch him and yeah. Sister Rosalie, Lord, and mm -hmm. Lord, these, the headaches that they're experiencing, Lord, mm -hmm. seemingly no relief. We pray, Father, that you would bring relief this morning, Lord, yes, that you Lord. would touch them, and Lord, that you would bring relief from the pain. And yes. Father, we just pray for Brother Mac, Lord, that you'd also touch his body and mm -hmm. bring relief from the pain that he's experiencing today. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray that you would just... Um, also help the doctors to know how best to help him. And yes, Lord, yes. we just pray for um, the lady that Sister uh, Christina talked about yeah. as well that mm -hmm. just had uh, a baby recently. And Lord, we pray that you would just touch mm -hmm. her body, Lord, that you would bring healing to her. Yes. And Lord, that you would just uh, continue your touch upon her baby as well, mm -hmm. Lord, yeah. that they would both be healthy. Mm -hmm. And Father, we pray for... Um, my sister, uh, Dawn, Lord, and her physical needs this morning, you know that she battles with cancer, Lord, and then has back surgery coming up. And Father, we pray that you touch her and mm -hmm. touch uh, her husband and then also their little grandbaby, Chevelle, Lord, this morning mm -hmm. in the emergency room, Lord. We pray yes, that you would Lord. just help her to be able to breathe freely and, Lord, that she would be free from this respiratory illness, Lord, mm -hmm. that she has. Mm -hmm. And Father, we pray especially for Rachel and Chuck James, Lord, yeah. and twins yeah. this morning, Lord. Yes. You are the great physician. We bring them to you, Lord. Yes. We thank yes. you that you are God who knows all, who sees all, yes. Lord, who hears all, Lord. You just yes. uh, hear our hearts yes. cry this morning. We thank you, Father, for that. And we pray that you touch the twins, Lord, that they would just yes. be um, healthy. Uh, both of them yes. would be healthy this morning. Um, Father, we just pray that you continue to be with the unspoken needs that are represented here today, Lord. And we know that each and every one of us carries things that are near and dear to our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, undertake and be with those who are incarcerated today, Lord, those who are on the streets, Father, those who are suffering in ways that we cannot see, Lord. We pray that you'd be with each one. Touch the Fimbris family, Lord, who's mm -hmm. sick, Lord, this weekend as well. We ask that you bring mm -hmm. healing to them. And, yes. and anyone else, Lord, who's experiencing sickness, Lord, we pray that you bring your healing touch, yes. Father, not only upon our physical bodies, but, Lord, maybe emotional or financial, Lord, whatever it is, that yeah. you would just touch each and every one. Uh, Father, we give this service to you. We pray that you'd anoint Pastor Steve as he yeah. brings your word, yeah. Lord, yeah. that you would just speak yeah. to him and through him. And Father, help us just not only to hear, but that we would be doers of the word, Lord. Okay. Help us to humble ourselves before you and know that you are um, God Almighty and there is none like you, Lord. And help us, Father, that we would just um, become closer to you, Lord, and that our light would shine for you, that others might see Christ and would be drawn to you. Well, thank you, Father, for yeah. this church and for this corner and for all you're doing in Jesus' precious name. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. He is able, I know. to carry me through. He is able, he is able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He heals the broken heart. And he 
sets the captives free. He makes the lame to walk again, and he caused the blind to see. He is able, he is able, I know. Gracious and loving Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning and gathering us here in your in this little temple here to worship you, to praise you, to thank you. We're so thankful, Lord, that you blessed us with many heavenly blessings in yeah. Jesus Christ. We thank you, word, Father, for your word that we read this morning, this beautiful song that says that you teach us, that you teach us to number our days and to acquire a heart of wisdom. Mm-hmm. Gracious Father, uh, help us, give us the wisdom that we need to to to, to know that our day, our, day, our days are numbered here on this earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To, to, to value the things that are priority. To, to value the things that are um, that are valuable in your heart, in your eyes. Mm-hmm. Help us, Lord, to, to seek the things that uh, please you. Live on this earth, Lord, uh-huh. in a way that uh-huh. we are a, an offering, of, an uh-huh. offering up to you and uh-huh. a sacrifice, Lord. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Pray for those that have we have 
physicians that have been mentioned, mm -hmm. pray for Beto, uh -huh. pray for Rachel and Chuck James and yeah. the twins. Uh -huh. We lift them up to you. We pray for Brother Mac, Brother Smith. Every single person in here, Lord, we all come here, maybe unknown. Uh, we haven't declared our petition, but we are pain. But we thank you, Father, for uh, every single one of us and the petitions that have been sounded out. Uh -huh. Tony's sister, Christina's friend, we just lift them up to you right now. Uh -huh. pray that you're the God that's able to meet our needs. You're uh -huh. the God that's able to uh, touch our lives wherever we might be. Uh -huh. So, gracious Father, we just thank you this morning for being here. And we pray for Pastor Steve that the word might come out and yes. just bless us and touch us and make us grow. Our gracious and holy Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful to be in your house this morning and just listening to all the prayer requests and the psalm, just reminded afresh of how fragile life is, uh, fragile from the womb, fragile from birth, and fragile really all of our days until our, our last breath. Life is just so fragile. And so like the psalmist, we pray that you would teach us to number our days aright. And we pray, Lord, that we would be able to live with wisdom that every day counts and that you would establish the work of our hands and help us to rest in the truth that you're from everlasting to everlasting, that we may be fragile, but you are not. And you're our maker. You're our creator. You're from everlasting to everlasting without beginning, without end, and that you are the one who made us and that you know us well and that you put us here on purpose and None of us are a mistake, none of us are an accident uh, that you created each and every one of us and that no matter how many days we have, you have a purpose for us in those days that we would reflect you, and that we would glorify you and that we would represent you well to each other and that your love would be made known through us. And so we pray that your purpose would indeed be accomplished in our lives. And Lord, you're the one who sustains us you're enthroned above, but you stoop low, and you know how fragile our lives are, and you're our healer, you're our sustainer, you're the one who provides for us, and we thank you for how you're so engaged in our lives, even in the womb, uh, all the way up until our last breath. And we thank you, Father, for your faithfulness and for your goodness to us. And we pray that you would be with those who are struggling financially today. We ask, Lord, that you would make a way. Those who are in need of work, those who are in need of better work, we pray, Lord, again, that you would open doors and that you would provide. Yes. And, Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with health issues, and, and we've listed many. Uh, we pray that you would be with Beto, that you would touch him, and that you would restore his, his sight. And we pray, Lord, that you would give him relief from the migraines. We pray that for yes. Rosaline yes. as well, that you would give her relief and that you would bring complete healing. And Lord, we pray for the little ones that we've mentioned, and we pray, Father, for healing there, and that you would make all things right and all things well. And Father, we have many that are dealing with chronic illnesses and ailments, and again, Lord, we ask for your healing touch, and we pray strength for the journey, and we pray, Lord, that there would be peace, and that there would be hope, and that there would be joy, and that your presence would be evident. And Father, we pray that you would be near to those who maybe going through some dark times and not sure which way to turn or what to do and life is full of more questions and answers. We pray, Lord, that you would give guidance and wisdom and the courage to take whichever steps that you show. Uh, maybe the whole path isn't lit up yet, but the next step is. And we pray, Father, for the courage and the grace to take that next step. And Father, we thank you especially for your great love for us that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that we could be reconciled to you, that we could have peace with you. Thank you, Lord. We're so undeserving, and you are so gracious. And we thank you for the love that you put within our hearts, that you spread abroad through your spirit. And we pray that we would grow in that love and become more and more loving. Help us, Lord, to trust you wholeheartedly, to hold nothing back from you, and help us, Lord, to love more and more deeply not just loving you more deeply, but loving one another more deeply. Those that you bring into our lives, Lord, can be quite challenging at times to love, 
We pray, Lord, for fresh power to love. And we pray, Lord, that we would reflect your love that we have received unto them. And Father, we count it such a privilege to cast all of our cares upon you. You so care for us. And so, Lord, even those things that maybe we haven't mentioned this morning, those persons that are dear upon our hearts, situations that are heavy, uh, Lord, we don't leave anything outside the door. We bring everything to you. And so we cast ourselves and all of our cares upon you. Lord, we pray for our, our city. We pray for our state. We pray for our nation. Pray for the leaders thereof. We pray, Father, that there would be a fresh humility to seek you first. Uh, sometimes it's just overwhelming when we think about all the troubles that we see in front of us today and all the troubles that we hear about today. We pray, Lord, that you would grant our, our leaders wisdom to discern your ways and to walk in your ways, whether they acknowledge you or not, for it's only your ways that are just and your ways that are right yeah. and your ways that bring peace. And Father, we pray for, pray for us on this corner. We pray for your church, all the places it's gathered today, across the street, downtown, uh, all parts of the globe. Yeah. We pray for a fresh outpouring of your spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would do such a work within us that it becomes very evident who you are and that others would come to know you, that all would come to know you and to receive you and to, to receive the fullness of your salvation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Well, I want to thank uh, Brother Tony for bringing such a great word last week and uh, Lord's anointing. And thank you, Brother Richard, Brother Mac, for taking care of Friday night a week ago. And Vaughn and I had a good retreat. And Pastor D, he sure looks refreshed. And, uh, and so, uh, but we are all great, grateful to be back. And a uh, few announcements. And so uh, Tuesday night before pie baking, or Tuesday night is pie baking night, not this Tuesday, but a week from Tuesday. And that is uh, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. I think the date for that is the 21st. And then on Wednesday night, November 22nd, that is the Thanksgiving dinner. And so it'll be at 5.30 Wednesday night, or Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Eve dinner. And uh, you know, bring your friends, bring family, tell people about it. We'll have lots of food. And so it'll be a great night of celebration and trusting that the Lord will use that night to display uh, his love and his splendor amongst us and through us. And so keep that in prayer. And then Advent season starts right after Thanksgiving. And the second Sunday of Advent, which is December 4th, uh, that evening we will go downtown to Living Water and we will uh, be in service with them on Sunday evening, uh, 6 o'clock, and that'll be December 4th. And so you might want to put that on your calendar as well. Uh, thank you for your giving and your faithfulness. The offering plates are back there. And just really appreciate how you are responsive to the Lord in all areas. The question for today, it's kind of a two-part question, so you can work with it however you would like. But uh, what does bad news do to you? So that's part one. Talk about what, when you hear bad news, whatever that bad news is, uh, what does that tend to do to you? And then part two of the question is when you hear good news, what does that do to you? And I'm not talking about any specific bad news or any specific good news. Just when you hear bad news, when you hear good news, what does that do to you? So talk about it with each other. Thank you. 
All right, I hear a lot of good conversation going on. And I think when I hear bad news, it makes my heart sink. And uh, just kind of kind of knocks you for a loop. And then when I hear good news, usually that just energizes me and gives me joy. And so bad news, heart kind of sinks, good news, joy. You feel lighter when you get good news. Uh, bad news, you just feel kind of heavy. Uh, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 today is our passage. And we'll go ahead and work with the whole chapter. So Isaiah chapter 61, give you a moment to get there. Uh, you'll see where the question comes from pretty quickly. So Isaiah chapter 61. And I got a gnat that likes me today. So Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and a release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow upon them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Aliens will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as a soil makes a sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of your word this morning. Thank you for how you have already been at work ministering in our midst today. And we pray that as we give our attention to your word, that you would speak afresh to us. And that you would help us to hear you, help us to receive you, help us to be obedient to you. Do all that you desire to do in us and through us for your glory. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Well, let me walk us through some context here a little bit. And I know many of you have been making this journey through Isaiah, and we've been in this journey for well over a year. It might be getting close to 
I don't know, we might be close to two years in Isaiah uh, making our way through. I don't think it's been quite that long, but we, we've been on a journey. And we have seen that kind of where we're at here in this part of Isaiah, they are back from exile. And so the technical word, this is post-exilic Israel. Uh, all that means is that, you know, they had sinned against God and God raised up the Babylonians to bring judgment upon them for their sinfulness, for their refusal to trust God, for their disobedience to God, and for even relying upon other sources and other things than God. And so judgment was brought upon them. How did God bring that judgment? He raised up the Babylonians, and they came, and they crushed Jerusalem. And that took place about 587, 586 B.C. And Isaiah announced that that day was coming. And then Isaiah has a word for those who are taken captive in the midst of exile, who are dealing with all the loss. And the word is comfort. The word is homecoming. The word is salvation. And so beginning in chapter 40 especially, there are hints of it earlier, but beginning in, especially in chapter 40, Isaiah begins to announce that God is going to comfort you, that God is going to save you, that exile is not the last word. Judgment and destruction is not the last word. That there is going to be homecoming. There's going to be restoration. And we saw that in chapters 40 to 55, kind of this word to the exiles that God is going to save you and this salvation we saw has some different dimensions to it that on the one hand they need to be saved from Babylon that they are under Babylonian rule they're in Babylonian captivity and God says okay I'm going to save you from Babylon and bring you back to Jerusalem back to the promised land and you know how God does this right through Cyrus, the king of Persia. And God raises up Cyrus, king of Persia, and in 539, the Persians defeat the Babylonians. In 538, Cyrus begins to enable Jewish people to go back to Jerusalem, and they begin to rebuild the temple. And so exile is technically over, and now we are in kind of the post-exile time. They're back from exile, back from captivity, and living in Jerusalem, and they get the temple rebuilt and rededicated to God about 515 B.C. And so we're, we're back now. And so we see that that salvation is accomplished. We also learn and recognize that they needed more than just saved from Babylon. That ultimately they needed saved from themselves, saved from their sin. They needed to be saved from the guilt of their sin. That that guilt had left them separated from God and, and at odds with God, their sin had. And so Isaiah announces that not only are they going to be saved from Babylon, but they're going to be saved from the guilt of their sin so they don't just go back to Jerusalem, but they can actually come back to God that there is forgiveness, that there is peace with God. And the way this will happen is through the work of the servant. And Isaiah talks about this servant figure, this servant king that God is going to raise up and through the suffering of the servant, he will be an atoning sacrifice for their sins so that they can have peace with God. Now Cyrus, that happened. For the servant, we see that as Jesus is the one who fulfills this. Now, as we've been talking the past several weeks in Isaiah, we recognize that they're back, that they've been saved from Babylon. We recognize the work of the servant in terms of forgiveness. But the real question that is dealt with kind of in 56 to 66 in those chapters is, okay, now you're back, how are you going to live? Now you're forgiven, how are you going to live? Are, are, have you been brought back and forgiven just so that you can live the same old life and repeat the same sins over and over and over and be just as stubborn and hard-hearted as you were? Is, is that all that happens? And they recognize, and we recognize ourselves, that we need saved from that. 
That we don't just need saved in terms of from our guilt and forgiven so that we're reconciled to God. We actually need to be saved from our propensity, our tendency to do evil. To reject God and to do one another wrong. And to live self-centeredly, to live selfishly. That we need saved from that. They needed saved from that. And what Isaiah is announcing is that you can't change yourself, but praise God, through the servant, we can be fully healed. So that we're no longer turned in on ourselves against God, against each other, against even creation that we can actually be transformed so that we live unto God and we truly reflect the character of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the love of God to each other in all of our actions so that we do each other right. And instead of living self-centeredly, we actually live life unto the glory of God, doing right to each other, even to creation. And so Isaiah has been announcing to them this this good news that God doesn't just save from Babylon. God doesn't just forgive sins as much as we need those things. But God actually heals us to where we can live truly new lives to the glory of God. And so that's especially what chapters 60 to 62 are all about. This, this new, deeper salvation, healing towards not just being brought back geographically. It's not just having sin atoned for so that our past is no longer held against us, but it's actually being changed to where there's power to live new life. So as we jump into 61 today, first, I don't know, it, it's real tempting to just jump to the Gospel of Luke. Okay, and some of you are laughing, some of you are chuckling because you know this well. Others of you are wondering, okay, why are they laughing about that? Okay, look with me. I'll just jump to Luke really quick. Look with me over to Luke chapter 4. And Jesus has been baptized. He's dealt with the temptations. And he goes home to his hometown synagogue. And we'll pick it up at 416. So Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, That's Isaiah 61. That's the passage that we're working with this morning. And it's really tempting to just go to Luke and start talking about Jesus. Okay, but I want to try to avoid that temptation for the moment. Not that that's really a technical temptation. But I want to try to not give in to that. And I want us to talk more about Isaiah's vision of the servant and this future salvation that Isaiah sees the servant accomplishing. This salvation to where we are truly changed, truly transformed. And so back to Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. I want us to think about that language for a moment. Who is the me? The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. Who is that me? And at one level, we would say, must be Isaiah. Because the Spirit is upon Isaiah, and we see that Isaiah has been preaching good news 
for ever since chapter 40, and even he has some good news before chapter 40. And so in one sense, we might say that Isaiah is talking about himself. But the language here is pretty interesting because you have this anointing and spirit language going together. Now, a few of you were here Friday night. Is this reminding you of anything? The two or three or four of you that were here, five of you that were here Friday night? What did Samuel do? He took the horn of oil, right? And he went and he anointed David and the spirit of the Lord came upon David. What was that all about? David was going to be the next king. You have spirit language and anointing language and you end up with a king. Now that happened right before that too. I wasn't here the previous week, but I know a couple guys who led a study about Saul. And I think I heard you guys talking about that last week that he was anointed and the spirit came upon him and they were saying, look, he's, Saul is prophesying. And again, what was Saul anointed for? What did the spirit come upon him for? To be king. What I'm trying to get you to see is that when we have... In Old Testament, when we have the spirit and anointing coming together like this, it's about a king. And so it's not just the spirit of the Lord is upon me in terms of Isaiah. Isaiah is basically role playing here, speaking as if he were the servant king. Are you seeing it? And so Isaiah, for the moment, I don't know how you want to envision it, but it's like for the moment he is role-playing as the servant king, anointed, empowered by the Spirit to bring God's kingdom. So not just a prophet speaking the word of God, but role-playing himself as the Messiah, as the suffering servant Messiah king who is going to be the one to bring about God's rule on the face of the earth. And so kind of recognize that, that he is not just speaking of himself, but even more so he is speaking that me is the servant king, the servant Messiah. And the language indicates that. Now look further at the work of the servant, the spirit anointed king. He has anointed me to do what? To preach good news to the poor. So that's the first kind of big statement. Preach good news to the poor. That's what he was anointed for. The next verse, for the, the rest of that verse in verse 2, kind of flushes that out. So on the one hand, you have anointed to preach. And on the other hand, you have sent. And so, sent to preach good news to the poor, what does all that look like? Who are the poor? Look at the rest of it. Bind up the brokenhearted. Proclaim freedom for the captives. Release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. What I'm trying to get you to see is that these balance each other out. They're parallel to each other. And so, and so this, this whole second thing is to shape how we understand the poor. So the poor is not just how much money you have in the bank. Poor means more than that. A person who is poor, some of our translation, translations will even go this way, preach good news to the afflicted. And so poverty is not just about money. Poverty is about affliction. Yeah. It's about pain. It's about being overwhelmed by life. Yes. And, and the truth is, well, Jesus kind of goes this direction. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who recognize that life is too much. Those who recognize that they're not self-sufficient for everything that life throws at us. 
We've even just heard today in our prayer request just how fragile life is. And so, at a certain level, every one of us fits the category of poor. The question is, are we willing to admit it? In terms of how inadequate we really are to deal with life. Because you can have all the money in the bank in the world not going to save you from death. And you might still be in despair. And so, so I don't want to discount, you know, lack of jobs, not knowing where your next meal is going to come from. So I don't want to dismiss that as poor. But we just got to think bigger when it comes to poor. And so again, think about it this way. To be poor... One aspect of that poverty is to be brokenhearted. That when you're brokenhearted, it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank, that when you're brokenhearted, you are downcast and you are poor. That when to proclaim freedom for the captives, when you have been captured by something, to where you have no freedom, you have no ability to kind of make decisions and to live life because you are so captivated, so addicted. That's another aspect of being poor. You can go through each one of these and think in terms of, okay, maybe this is what poor looks like. Darkness. Release from darkness for the prisoners. Have you ever been through a time where it just felt like darkness was overwhelming. That you could not see the light of anything. Just heavy darkness and you were under it. Again, it wasn't about money. It wasn't about material things. Just stuck in darkness. We go further. The year of the Lord's favor. What the year of the Lord's favor refers to is, is Jubilee. And the Jubilee year, property would be given back. It happened every 50 years. And it was so that there would be release from debt. Release and kind of a second chance. A second chance at life. There's an economic dimension to it, social dimension to it. But the whole idea was that you were going to get a second chance. And without that second chance, not only were you stuck, but your children were stuck. Generation after generation, just stuck because of no second chances. Again, I don't want to take the economic dimension out of it. But there's other ways that we get stuck generation after generation with no second chances. And so the year of the Lord's favor, this jubilee year, this kind of once in a lifetime, second chance. Okay, and then the last one here, or no, there's two more. The day of vengeance of our God. What that would refer to is oppression. That there's going to come a day when, through the work of the servant, that those oppressors will experience release from the oppressors. And that God will bring about actual justice. That's what the vengeance is about. To establish justice over oppressors. And then finally, the mourning. To comfort all who mourn. All who are dealing with loss. And when we think about mourning, we think about loss, we think about grieving. Really, we're not thinking about our bank accounts. We're thinking about our loved ones. We're thinking about Dennis and Bryce. We're thinking about us. And every one of us have lost dear loved ones. And we know that nothing really makes up for that. Except hope that we might be reunited one day. So to comfort all who mourn. So uh, I'm just trying to get you to see you got to think broader in terms of this poverty and in terms of the work of the Spirit. Uh, and, 
and the servant. And maybe one more thing. The servant doesn't just bring good news. The servant is the good news. Think about that with Jesus. Jesus, the servant, he brings the good news, but he is the good news. And so we see the work of Jesus. We see Jesus is at the center of the news about him. So anyways, we got to keep moving. So 61 verse 3. This, I think, for me is maybe the most exciting part of the whole of the whole chapter. Providing for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So, yes, I see that transformation from being a people who mourn and grieve and are downcast and beat up to being a people that are just covered and filled <coughs> with joy and with gladness, but especially <coughs> this transformation. Excuse me. Maybe I swallowed my nap. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I did, but but the transformation and they're going to be called, they're going to be recognized as oaks of righteousness. Instead of a beat up people, instead of a withering people, being called oaks of righteousness. Now this of goes two directions. So the first direction we have to think about in terms of this of is oaks of righteousness. How did they become oaks of righteousness? Not by their own strength. Not by their own power. They didn't just wake up one morning and decide, you know, I'm going to be an oak of righteousness. The way that they become oaks of righteousness is by the righteousness of God. They become oaks of righteousness by God's right doing. God is going to do them right so that they are transformed into an oak, a mighty oak, an oak of righteousness. And so all of this, again, just thinking big picture, God is doing them right. He's not going to leave them in judgment. He's not going to leave them in Babylon. How right is God going to do them? God is going to do them so right that he brings them home. God is going to do them so right that he forgives them. God is going to do them so right that he changes them. And so they are an oak of righteousness first and foremost because of God's right doing. It's his righteousness that transforms them from being a beat up, desolate, downcast people into a grove of oaks yes. is by God's righteousness. Okay, are you seeing it? Yes. Second way the of goes. They become a people who do righteousness. They couldn't do that on their own. Mm -hmm. That on their own they did wrong. They rebelled against God. They did each other wrong. They lived self-centeredly. And they paid the cost of it. But God is so doing them right that he brings them home, that through the servant he forgives them, and through the servant he transforms them so that they become a people that's able to actually do right. In terms of fully trusting God, in terms of doing right by each other, in terms of genuinely caring beyond themselves and living, growing to the glory of God instead of turned in on themselves. Are you seeing it? So oaks of righteousness, they become oaks because of God's right doing. And then, I don't know, the acorns they drop? Righteous deeds. And so they become a people where the birds can nest, people can take shade in their presence. I mean, you get the imagery. 
a mighty oak tree and all the right things that come from it. To me, that is just so exciting to think about the transformation that God is going to bring about. And then the, the next part of it, a planting of the Lord. Who brought it about? The Lord did. Who planted them? The Lord did. Who grew them? The Lord did. Who changed them to where they're actually producing righteousness in their living? The Lord did. And look, why? The display of His splendor. Wow. God's splendor displayed. Not in the stars of the sky. Not in a beautiful sunrise. Not in a glorious sunset. Not in some aspect of the beauty of creation. But God's splendor displayed in this people that have been so changed that they do right. How changed have they been? So changed that God can be seen in their living, in their growing, in their relationships, that they become the display of God's splendor. Are, are, are you seeing why I'm getting excited? What if that's us? What if we become oaks of righteousness? A planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And it's not that we can make ourselves that. It's not that we plant ourselves. It's his righteousness. It's his right doing that brings us together, that forgives us through Christ, but even more heals us through Christ. So that we are transformed, changed people living new lives of righteousness, doing right. And that God has planted us for the display of his splendor. Not planting us so that we can just have it easy. Not planting us so that we just have a better life. Not planting us just so that we're more comfortable. But planting us, not for our glory, but for the display of his splendor. Yes. That he wants to reveal himself through us. Yes. So, I get excited about that when I think about the vision here and the work of the servant and this, this grove of oak trees. Look a little bit further. What are these oak trees going to do? These oaks of righteousness. And again, it's all metaphorical. But verse 4, they will rebuild the ancient ruins, restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Like, wow. Rebuild, restore, renew. The most broken of places. The places of generations of devastation. And that that's what God is transforming them for. God is growing them to be these oaks of righteousness, you know, by his right doing, that they would do right, not simply so that they have it comfortable, but for the display of his splendor. And how's that going to get displayed? Because they are going to, God is going to work through them to bring restoration, to bring renewal, to bring that transformation to the most devastated of places. Wow. I don't know. I'm kind of, you know how I can see that through cities. And when I think about cities, ruined cities, yeah, I think about all of the villages of Judah. I think about Jerusalem. But, you know, cities are where people try to live life together. And where people try to live life together and if people are living self-centered, it's going to be pretty messed up, huh? And it could be ruin after generation after generation after generation. But to have those relationships rebuilt, restored, renewed, so that there's peace. Whether we're talking a church, whether we're talking a family, whether we're talking a community. 
But to have some oaks of righteousness that are at work in those devastated, seemingly forsaken places to bring about renewal and restoration. Wow. Let's go further. Kind of switches a little bit, but we're talking about those people still. And I just want to highlight verse 6. And you will be called priest of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. Now going way back, we spent a few months ago, a Friday night, a story you need to know, Exodus 19. And they're at Mount Sinai. And he hasn't given them the Ten Commandments yet. God's making a proposal to them. That if you, you've seen what I've done for you. I brought you out of Egypt. How I carried you to myself on eagle's wings. Now if you'll listen to me. If you'll keep my covenant. If you'll obey my voice. Then you'll be for me most treasured of all the peoples on the earth. You'll be for me a kingdom of priests. And a holy nation. And their purpose, their calling was to be this priestly people amongst the nations. And as a priestly people, God's blessings don't just come upon them. God's blessings go through them to the nations. And as a priestly people, they don't just pray for themselves. They take the needs of all the nations around them and bring those needs to God. And as a priestly people, they teach the ways of God and the knowledge of God to all the peoples around them. And so what, what Isaiah is seeing here is God is going to do them so right that not only does he bring them home, not only does he forgive them, but God is going to change them so that they actually produce righteousness in their lives, the righteousness of God, and that they are going to now be fit to play this priestly role amongst the nations. So that his blessings go through them. And they don't just pray for themselves. They pray for everyone. Bringing those needs to God. And his splendor is displayed in their lives and through their lives. So that their lives become a teaching of who God is. What an important role to play. God is saving them and changing them. Not just so that they can kind of live a new, better life, but so that they really do become the, the display of his splendor and they play this priestly role within the world, within the nations. Okay, I know, i got to keep moving. So let's go a little further. The foundation for this, verse 8. Well, verse 7. Just look at the first line and the last line of verse 7. Instead of their shame, everlasting joy will be theirs to move from shame to joy for I the Lord love justice I hate robbery and iniquity in my faithfulness I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them their descendants will be known among the nations their offspring among the peoples and look at this last part all who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed like wow People will recognize them. The Lord bless them. So who gets known? The Lord. It reminds me, uh, again, of, of another place in Scripture, Psalm 67. Lord bless us so that all the peoples will know you. And all the peoples will praise you. And here the Lord is saying, I'm going to so bless that all peoples will know that I'm the one who blessed you. A display of his splendor. Okay, verse 10. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation, arrayed me in a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes a sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Okay, here's the question. Verse 10. Who is the I? I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. There's a few responses to who the I is. 
So some would say the servant. That's who we are talking about in verses 1 to 3. And so it must be the servant. Here's the servant speaking. Isaiah is kind of impersonating the servant so that the servant is saying that I, the servant, delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. He has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. That God has saved me, that God has clothed me in salvation, clothed me in righteousness. So that's one response. Okay, a second response is that it's Isaiah. That here Isaiah is talking about himself and how he delights in the Lord and how his soul rejoices and how God has clothed them, clothed him. The more dominant response, yeah, that Isaiah is here speaking for Zion, the, the, the people of God that have been brought home, mm -hmm. that have been reconciled to God, that have been changed by God. And so, yeah, we can count ourselves as a people kind of in that community, brought home, forgiven, mm -hmm. and experiencing God's transforming work so that we're being made into oaks of righteousness for the display of his splendor. And so listen to, listen to it again and think about this as being your words. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, so are these garments of salvation this robe of righteousness. Yes. And so we're invited to be the eye of delighting in the Lord, of being transformed so that we are clothed by God's right doing so that we're able to do right. Yes. The sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Now, we open the service with the story of Zacchaeus. And that's found in Luke chapter 19. And so I want you to turn there with me. Luke 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And remember, Jesus has already announced that, you know, Isaiah 61 is fulfilled in him. He's a servant king. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. Chief tax collector, very wealthy. Was he poor? Yes. <laughs> yeah. He was poor. And he knew it. He knew it. He wanted to see Jesus. Because he knew his life was incomplete. And it wouldn't be complete until he saw Jesus. That working for Rome and all the wealth he amassed, he was still missing something. He recognized his poverty and that he needed to see Jesus. And so he's short. The crowd won't let him through to the front. So verse 4, he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus because he saw Jesus coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. What do you think happened to his heart? Bad news, good news. Good news. Jesus came to proclaim good news to poor Zacchaeus. I must stay at your house today. And look what that good news did to Zacchaeus. Verse 6. So he came down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. 
Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Amen. What happened to Zacchaeus? I think he became an oak of righteousness. And I have a feeling that, you know, when you think about an oak tree, you're normally thinking about a tree that's going to be around for a while. Yeah. Do you think he would have made it into the scripture if this was, you know, only for a moment? Like Jesus moves on to the next town and Zacchaeus goes back to being the same guy? That wouldn't be an oak of righteousness. I think he must have made it in to Luke's account, not just because he was forgiven, but because he was changed. And that change was lasting. An oak of righteousness for the display of the splendor of the Lord. He became that I who delights in the Lord, clothed in salvation and righteousness. That's for us. That's the good news. That we don't have to stay in Babylon. We can be brought home to the Lord and be at peace with God. But the good news doesn't stop there. The good news is even better news that we can be changed and transformed into an oak of righteousness by God's right doing so that we live a life of doing right by each other, by God, by our communities. We become oaks of righteousness. One of my probably all-time favorite verses is Philippians 1.6. Paul writes to the church there at Philippi, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will continue to perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Continuing to grow us into oaks of righteousness. Yeah. Not just a forgiven people, a transformed people. And that's why we take communion every week. We take communion as a way for us to invite Jesus to do His work in us so that we're changed so that we become the display of His splendor, the display of His righteousness, that that righteousness springs up in our lives and through our lives. And so this morning as we take communion, if it's your desire to be changed into an oak of righteousness, open yourself up to receive all the right doing that God wants to do in your life to change you so that you actually do right. Yes. Do right in trusting Him. Do right in loving one another. Do right in listening to Him. And so, Christina, if you and Charlene and Sister Vonda, if you would come and uh, lead us in um, the, the second song that you were singing, The Goodness of God. It's out of His goodness that He desires to change us and will change us. Yeah. And Pastor D, if you would come and, and uh, distribute the elements and if you desire to experience and to receive and continue to allow the Lord to work in you, just let Pastor D know and He'll give you the, the bread and the cup and then we'll take communion together once everyone has been served.
so right in Christ Jesus and we pray that your right doing would just continue to get more and more done in our lives continue that good work that you have begun to transform us into oaks of righteousness we pray that we truly would be a people of your planting a people in which your splendor is displayed that your salvation your righteousness would spring up amongst us would be would sprout and bear fruit for your glory in jesus name we pray amen Amen. on the night that our lord was betrayed he was gathered in the upper room with his disciples celebrating the passover meal and jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take and eat this is my body which is broken for you And then in like manner, Jesus took the cup, and when he'd given thanks, he said, Take and drink. This is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all, growing you into oaks of righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yesterday I was doing um, some